What up, ladies and gentlemen, Jesse Warden here. Today we have a little unscripted video about testing. Jesse Warden. Got a comment from a subscriber or fan or just awesome dude on YouTube. His comment really resonated with me and I wanted to take today to talk about some of the points that he brought up. So I had posted a series of videos on test driven development and testing in general, whether you're doing object oriented or functional programming, either one. The point is, is that they have that thing in common and that you shouldn't think of TDD as object-oriented programming only or functional only. It's all code and it's a little <laughs> difficult and imperative like shell style code because it doesn't expose things that are really testable. So I wanted to, to talk about that because he has this wonderful comment that's just full of nuances and problems that are interesting. I wanted to talk about some of them. This is really just me being frustrated. Uh, some of the things I have tips on, but I just wanted to talk about it because it's a common problem that we have. So his comment is Nikita Melnikov, and he said he starts writing tests about three years ago. He decided when he tried the Nest framework, and he wanted to say that tests aren't as popular in his experience in the industry. Mostly here, it's just a waste of time from either fellow coworkers or research that he's done, and he doesn't think so. Right, Something in his gut, his instincts are telling him that that advice is wrong. And I like that, right? Trust in your instincts. You, you know something's off. Right? But he writes tests the best he can, all he can. I, and he doesn't really know why he has a challenge, but maybe it's a small outsourcing company, maybe just unlucky, but he usually gets a lot of legacy projects with dirty code. So let's let's tap on that because I covered a lot. Let's When you write new code and practice it doing SGS, it's a good thing. But... When you are surrounded by people who think that testing isn't important or think it's not popular or think they don't need to do it because it doesn't get them the job or doesn't allow them to keep their current job, then you're surrounding yourself by people who are not doing your programming career good service. It's very similar to where my wife had some advice from me a long time ago. She said she'd always surround yourselves by people who bring you up, not bring you down. And you don't want to hang out. So I used to, when I was 14, I started smoking. And I was around smokers. And so I never had the thought to quit. When I started dating my wife at the time, girlfriend, she wasn't a smoker. And she made any type of kissing so difficult because I'd have to brush my teeth every time. And, you know, I'm, I'm young in my 20s. I smoke a lot. I'm stressed, right? And so that just kind of, you know, started it. The second was being at work where no one else smoked. And I had a, a peer group, which was all about health focused and working out and running and you know, eating healthy. And so that culture kind of brought me up to a better place. I was, I, I saw that there was a better way to live and I saw good role models on how to do that. Okay. Our, our good friend Nikita here doesn't clearly have those good role models. He's surrounded by people who don't think testing is good. That's incorrect. There's the only evidence that shows that software is reasonably good is through tests. Like that's science. Like there's not as many as nutrition, but there's enough studies to show and they corroborate each other, right? Now, how we do that, whether you test first, that's up for debate, but they exist. So the science says that tests are good. So that's, that's a problem. So what that means is you're not being surrounded by people that bring you up. And that's hard because sometimes the people who believe that get promoted to leadership and those people hire new developers and they look for those qualities and they let the people in who also don't care about testing. Or if they bring in testing, eh, you're not going to do that here anyway, whether you believe it or not. And so that's a problem. Confirming, that's a long way to say it's not you, it's them, right? You're a good person. Your instincts are telling you it's wrong. You're just not surrounded by good role models. So the second was I write tests all the time. But, you know, it's hard because you'll get code that was untestable. So there's two problems, not one. There's two problems with untestable code. The first is that it's not testable. So if you want to make the code better, you have to change the code. Now, notice I didn't say refactor. You have to change it. So if the code's already bad, and touching it could make it fall, just like blowing ever so slightly on this camera that's mounted in my face, it could fall and destroy everything. So you don't have any tests. So you don't know if you change it, if you broke anything. Now, maybe you have types. Maybe you have some kind of basic end-to-end -end test to help you out. But if you don't have anything then you're going to have to change it and pray, which means if you're on a deadline, you're not going to be able to do a lot of change, which means you're going to have to do really small changes that mitigate risk. And the problem with programmers is that they know that just because you change something that doesn't break now doesn't mean it won't break later. So even making that small change 
can give you fear and loathing for a week. It's a very, very stressful thing to do. And that's not a good way to live. And so your natural instinct is to say, just look, I'm a decent coder. I can knock this out. I'll just make this code work, add the changes, and we'll keep going on. If something breaks, I'll go try to figure out and fix it or just learn why the code's behaving the way it does, right? And that is a horrible, horrible behavior. It's, it's a fight or flight syndrome. It works. It keeps you alive. It keeps you employed. It keeps your boss happy. But that doesn't make the code better. It doesn't improve your career. And that's prevalent all throughout our industry. So again, it's not you. It's just a very constant thing is that people who see that don't know of a way out. They don't know how to take legacy code and test it. There's a book that this thing's literally sitting on. It's called Working Effectively with Legacy Code. Now, some of the, the techniques are sort of dated, but a lot of it's still very relevant on how you can create mocks and fakes and spies and things like that and adapters in code, not just tests, to make working with that code testing better. Very, very hard problem, very, very prevalent, and you're not alone. A lot of people do it. And because those teams, that built that code didn't have good role models around to bring them up and teach them the way to do that. And so when they offload it to an outsourcing company, they're kind of just left with it. And notice they said, like, Nick, I'm sure Nikita could probably do consulting the way he talks on my blog. Like he's clearly intelligent, very articulate, right? But he didn't say the word consulting. <laughs> so that means like your job is to deliver X features or, you know, software not to add advice. And that's really disappointing because clearly Mr. Melnikov here has a lot of serious expertise that he could offer and bring and, and recognize that he knows that something's wrong and he's not either allowed to fix it or not encouraged to fix it, which is just awful. It's really awful. That's why. The reason people don't think it's good is because they're not surrounded by people that bring them up. They don't know science. They haven't read the research. No one's told them about the research. They haven't seen the white papers or read the books, right, to see the tests that we've done to prove that tests are good. Those people don't exist around you, so you don't bring them up. And it's a very common problem in our industry. And you know it's wrong just because there's, you know, the status quo. It doesn't make it okay. Usually he gets legacy projects with dirty code, and there's no reason to talk about tests with people who are proud of a Christmas tree <laughs> if conditions, even not callbacks. That is so true because when you have that nested if or the callbacks or whatever else, it's not always intentional malice. A lot of people working on these code bases are exhausted. Brain uses a lot of the same sugar and mechanisms that when you work out, it makes you tired and it's mentally exhausting. So when you've done that for weeks and months on end and things are progressively getting worse, where are you supposed to summon the willpower to have an extra two hours at the end of the day to go, okay, today I'm going to add some tests or today I'm just going to do five minutes of positive change and make sure I don't break it and then add tests and keep going. It's not that simple because the, the work you did four days ago might have broken something and you're not really sure. So what do you do? Undo like 50 git commits? Like, you know, it's very, very difficult, very, very stressful. And so what happens is you get a lot of apathy. You can look at code bases and see the, the lack of love. You can see that people are just frustrated or tired or hate and they put that in the code base. And if that nested if state and people say, well, it's not code quality or, you know, code craftsmanship. Sometimes people are just trying to survive, irrespective of the fact that we're in a pandemic, okay? <laughs> like, they're just trying to survive, do their job. Maybe they don't even like coding. Maybe they love coding, but they were put in a job where they had this legacy code base as their first internship. It's really tough. So a lot of empathy for that, a lot of understanding. And I, I don't like nested if statements. I hate callbacks. You know, I saw some advice actually on Twitter yesterday. It was hilarious. This, this woman said, my therapist said, I need to stop giving people the benefit of the doubt and that they might have malicious intentions because every time I give them the benefit of the doubt, it takes my energy to feel sorry for them. Maybe they are bad people, maybe not. And I, I would rather collapse in a heap than believe that. I believe that everybody who puts on code is trying. I've never met anybody who maliciously messed with code unless they were a contractor and they had a payment dispute with the the client, right? No one intentionally writes bad code on purpose. They either don't know any better, they're not surrounded by mentors and seniors to help them, or they're exhausted. A lot of that stuff is because when you look at that, it seems overwhelming to fix. It seems like it's, you know, there's just too much mess and lack of care and lack of love, and it's not worth saving. We just got to keep the engine running. That's all the money we have. And sometimes that's all you can do within reason. It depends on how high strung you are and how much energy you have.
I get it, mad empathy. And all that time, it is a pain. No one listens to you. No money for refactoring. No time for discussing. No documentation and comments and so on and so on. And he's right. A lot of these projects are handed off and developers, especially senior ones, assume reasonable intent. They're like, well, you've been coding for a few years. You know that if there's no documentation, you can just go read the code and figure it out and compile it and just figure it out. That's what we developers do. We read and twink, tinker and poke buttons until something works and we figure out. And it's like, it's awful. <laughs> That's not the way things should be. We should really try to write comments and documentation. It is hard, but that's why it's called work. If it was easy, everyone would do it and we can get paid. And so that's why, you, you know, I have total empathy for that. I've seen that time and time again. And it's, it's good to call it out because it's not okay. It's not okay to do things like that. Onboarding each time is more challenging than the whole project, which I agree, getting new developers on board. And that's why I think TDD is cool. Cool. I got, I, got a, I got someone who thinks it's cool too. So now we're immediately friends. But in my case, you're not ready to refactor a service with 5,000 lines, and all that you can do is just cover two helper methods with the unit tests. And TD for me is like another universe. And I mean, he's right. Like you're, you're trying to take code that's untestable and then make it testable, right? And then you're like, okay, how do I start doing TDD? The general rule is, and I can, I can help you out a little bit. The general rule is you are right. Believe in yourself. Your instincts are correct. And unfortunately, you're going to have to be the adult in the room. <laughs> so when I say adult, I mean the one who knows what they're doing, the one who can sh you know, lead by example. So the, the way, the reason you got where you are is because you didn't have that high level of software craftsmanship, that caring, that series of tests, that commenting of code, that writing of documentation. You now have a way to get yourself out. And then once you've done that, it's a lot easier to prevent yourself from getting there again. Now, it's going to take some practice, okay? But the first thing you do is that anytime you have to modify some code, you write a test for it. I know it's not that easy. I get it. Sometimes modifying one line in a 5,000 line service is a method, and it's literally 5,000 lines long. There's no return value, there's too many things to mock. But you start not writing unit tests, you write an end to end test. And those are important because you want to know does the app work? And that's what an end end test is for. Does the app work? So if you can determine that a test, that any type of code that you change, and you can run that test to verify your code didn't break the app, you are golden. Because at that point, you can tweak around with unit tests to make the code function, and you'll have a sense, a safety net to know. So you need some basic end end tests, and those are worth your time. They say they're hard to write, but when you're already... <laughs> at rock bottom and you can't go any further writing selenium or puppeteer or even cypress like you know if you if you're lucky enough to write cypress then that's that's where you should be because it, once you have that safety net in place then you can start tackling the insane mess so once you've got those in place the unit tester anytime you write new code you write a test for it but instead of writing code for it think about the interaction so for example if you have let's say a 5,000 line service class that maybe makes some CRUD operation and it calls things. Write the API that you want. So this thing's calling it, but it's probably calling it a certain way. It might could be one line of code that says fetch dot then, or it could be Python where it's just like get the data and call it a day, but then it sets some configs ahead of time. Take that and think about what you want it to be and then write a test for that and then make this code support that interface. And if you're in a dynamic language, it actually might be more simpler because you can either write wrapper methods or helper methods or futz around with object prototype to muck around those class methods to get them to return what you want. And that way you can significantly reduce how much mocks and stubs and stuff that you have to get that class to work. So write new code, write a test first for the API that you want. If you can't do that because it's hard, fine. Like do what you've been doing. Write a unit test for the utils. Write a unit test for new code. Write a test for modified code. And don't be afraid if you learn something new in doing that to go back to the end-to-end -end test and make them a little more flexible to look for side effects that may be kind of indicators that something might go awry in the future. That's important. A lot of those signals are right, and you should look for that. And then lastly is keep practicing because once you start doing that. You write the end in test. You look for those problems. You write the unit test for code that changed. You write the API you want and you write the test first. On old code, you can manifest that code from what it is now to what you want it to be. And it's hard. Maybe it could be five minutes a day and you're exhausted. 
could be in the morning, right? It could be whenever you your circadian rhythms enable you to work best, and that's fine. But um, be aware you're not alone. I guess I just wanted to say you're not alone. That's that's how it is, especially in outsourcing companies when you're not expected to bring your expertise to the table of the best you. You're just supposed to deliver, and that's really unfortunate because I've met a lot of outsourcing companies that they're people like me, developers. They just happen to work for outsourcing. So just because it says the outsourcing and mindset consulting, we're equal. Like they bring a lot to the table. I hope I bring a little to the table. Together we can kick massive butt, right? It's just unfortunate. And lastly, that you're not surrounded by people who believe in the science of tests, believe in the practice and the good whatever, but you're doing the right thing. The Boy Scouts used to say that you should always leave the campsite better than you found it. So wherever you go in the forest or the woods, you want to make sure that it, obviously there's going to be a little trace of left behind that you were there, but you try to leave it better and you found it. You get, you pick up the trash, you organize things, you dust off the tables of crumbs and things like that. You try to, you know, put trash bags in the trash bags that are empty. So when they come there, they don't have to deal with it. Like make it better than you found it. And that code base, it, it, it's good for your soul. And it's a good example for people who don't know any better, right? You're, you're leading by example. You're not telling them that they should test. You're just leading by example. And if they ask, great. If they review PRs, cool, right? And that's fantastic. Nikita Melanikov, you're a hero. Keep doing what you're doing. I'm sorry that you're in that situation, but I, I am dealing with everything you wrote in your post at work right now. So <laughs> we're on the complete same playing field, brother. My name is Jesse Warden. You guys have any questions about test or unit test or test and development, let me know. Definitely check out Dave Farley. He's been doing a lot of wonderful videos talking about test driven development, acceptance testing, behavior driven development, and hopefully it'll get you really inspired to just realize that TDD is really just testing. You just test first and you start thinking about the implementations and there's some back and forth. It's not as black and white as regular and refactory talks about, and that's fine. There's, there's learning. It's not something you just pick up and do, but definitely check it out. Hopefully it'll get you inspired pumped and it'll get, get you out of the doldrums, get you inspired. Good luck.